So our next speaker is Daniel Pearl, who will deliver his presentation entitled Community Inspired Housing in Canada, Lessons Learned and Reapplied. Daniel Pearl co-founded LUF, L'Office d'Ecletisme Urbain et Fonctionnel, in 1992 in order to concentrate his expertise in sustainable environmental design. From site selection and analysis, program development and community planning, to innovative community scale green infrastructure, LUF's built work has reflected their balanced approach to evaluating multiple facets of a project right from the outset. Architectural expression, economic feasibility, life cycle assessment, construction techniques, and the environmental impacts of a project by way of IDP, integrated design process, which we've heard about earlier today. In 2014, key elements of LUF's work were published in the book, Community Inspired Housing in Canada, by Daniel Pearl and Daniel Wentz. Daniel's presentation and the book document a 20-year roadmap of experiments in both empowering communities to build, own, and operate their own buildings and infrastructures. His work sheds light on how complex such a goal can be, given the fragile nature of housing projects in the parapublic sector. The presentation con concludes with Luft's latest large-scale collective housing project under construction, bois Ellen in Laval, Quebec, which moves significantly towards the passive house standard, minimal maintenance, all while promoting affordability. Please join me in welcoming Daniel. Thank you very much, and that's almost a little bit too generous a presentation, uh, introduction, because uh, I think today, part of my goal, uh, Thomas asked me to talk about all the lessons learned. I only have uh, 45 minutes, and uh, probably if you want to learn more about all the lessons learned, you have to read the book. Uh, forget the first 20 pages, because uh, they talk about everything that's good. And then just start reading about page 21, and you'll start to learn about some of the challenges. And I think that's really important, and I'm very proud that uh, the Wholesome Foundation sponsored this book uh, because um, it's the first time in their 20 or 10 year history that there's a book that really doesn't talk about excellence alone, it talks really about all the problems along the way. Um, so this uh, presentation will look at, um, yes, this 20 year history, it started off with Benny Farm, which is really about social activism some of the lessons learned and how we apply it to our next project in Rosemo. I apologize right away to the translators because uh, I'll have to start to talk fast uh, at some point for all the material that I have, so I apologize now. And then there's lessons learned even from Rosemo and Benny Farm that we're applying to our current project under construction now in, in Laval, Quebec, bois -Len. But I think maybe what makes this presentation a little bit different than previous presentations um, we start and we work for the community. We, we are trying to empower the community. We don't believe that the market, the private market, is going to significantly move the greenhouse gas emission changes and the lifestyle changes that we need alone, and that uh, this is a huge sector in Canada. It's a very vulnerable sector. They don't have a history of great maintenance and operations, and it becomes really a, a difficult challenge. So while we're trying to be ecologically sensitive, we have to be affordable, flexible, and uh, I do believe we have to have architectural excellence as well. So this, this is uh, always suicidal. Um, one of our ways of trying to do this is we, we both do a fair bit of research. I'm a half-time professor at University of Montreal in the School of Architecture. It does allow me to justify spending time on research and then applying and then trying to learn the lessons learned. I also get very scared uh, when I see um, these kind of um, efforts to think that we'll somehow deal with climate change through a series of scientists who are going to um, kind of engineer our way out of our challenge instead of trying to work on our lifestyle. I'm not against trying to engineer. I just don't want to put all of our faith in that option. It doesn't sound like a very sound, sustainable way of going forward. And so, yes, we look at technical innovation, and it's interesting, this is an exhibit that goes back about uh, 15 years ago at the Canadian Centre for Architecture, and you can see that there's a kind of a wind turbine in the middle uh, that's not turning, and then there's these windmills that are totally ornamental, that are constantly moving. The wind turbine needs 20 kilometres for it to really function, and the other is about five. So I think it's, we have to find this balance uh, in technical innovation. 
We do integrated design. It does bring the cost up. Yes, we love to have people like Christian around the table on day one, especially being able to have three of Christian so we can question them and figure out all the different hidden things inside their data so they all can honestly expose what they're really doing. Uh, and that's why we are very, very attached to our engineers and our landscape architects and our sociologists and all the people around the table because we know there's so much risk uh, in a project that's uh, walking this uh, tightrope. Um, in more recent years, uh, not just because of Passive House, but just because the clients have asked for this, and some of them are very vulnerable. This project here is a, a housing for seniors residents at Benny Farm, and the seniors spend a lot of time in their units, and having thermal comfort uh, is a little bit more important, actually, than their energy savings in, in many ways. But I think... Uh, We've had to get into the cost-benefit analysis, and uh, one of the big lessons that I'm learning <laughs> over this 20 years is there's never any money for education. <laughs> education of the people living in the building, they change over time, how they operate the building. Uh, it's sudden funny how we build in the kind of uh, the mortgage to pay off the renewable, but no one pays off the mortgage to continuously educate. And I think that uh, it's one of the components that we're going to have to start learning how to, how to do. Uh, I'm really proud that uh, places like the Canadian Centre of Architecture held a, a wonderful book launch and debate on the future of affordable housing in Canada. Uh, beautiful people like Joe Lopko came in from Toronto and we had the, the founder of the CCA, Phyllis Lambert, and but we also had uh, Florence Palt who runs a homeless shelter for women uh, in Montreal. And having that kind of dialogue across quite a wide range of spectrum is really the key in my mind as we move forward. Uh, Thomas Homer Dixon, very well known in many circles in Canada, has talked about the upside of the crises coming forward and things breaking down and the lack of resilience as maybe an opportunity to rebuild our infrastructure. And uh, Ronald Wright, another person now living and working in Canada, um, historian, really talks about there is no lack of technical knowledge out there or, or, or we don't really need any more technology. We just need to kind of look at our values, our socioeconomic and cultural values and find a way to balance everything out. So I do feel honored when I get to present after uh, a, a kind of a, a very technical presentation, uh, which, which is at the heart of all work. We have to do technicals. And so in a sense, we do have to monitor our work and it's funny that I get government grants for our social housing projects, but I, I'm the one who actually has to go get other government grants to actually monitor the projects because it doesn't come with the program, which is a bit bizarre. That was one of the great parts of the equilibrium program that uh, you had no choice but to monitor. So in, in most of our social housing cases, it's thanks to CMHC and Arcan and sometimes uh, Société d'Habitation du Québec that we've had some monies, but it's always such a struggle and it seems backwards to me because that's so important. I do spend a lot of time uh, on the theory part of how to look at frameworks for sustainability. Uh, there is this whole idea of net positive development, which to me is much better than net positive energy. And uh, it's quite a wide range. It, it may surpass uh, the time that I have today to get into it. But I really believe that um, this is what's going to drive people to change health and happiness and not energy savings. So quality of life uh, for the people you're working with is fundamental. If you don't get that, uh, we're not working together. This is one of my favorite graphics. It looks at ecological footprint. Uh, what's our right to share of, uh, to our share of global resources? I think as COP21 and other meetings around the world happen, we're going to start to have these uh, real ethical debates as what amount do we have the right to use of those natural resources left? And then that's on the other side, you have our carrying capacity. What are the limitations that, that, that each context can handle? And so they're not necessarily balanced. Some people have the oil or the hydroelectricity next door to them, um, but they're living in a very vulnerable context or, or vice versa and, and all these combinations. And I think we're going to have to find a framework that really balances both of these and looks at the values of lifestyles. First Nations in Canada are, are quite important and have a long history of talking about this. And in the end, I think people are not going to buy into this by being 
by through guilt or through uh, legislation alone. I think it's going to take a transformation of lifestyle, and I think that it's got to be a better quality of life and better public spaces. And uh, if you're going to live in a smaller home that's going to use less energy, well, you want to live in a public space that compensates for the fact that you're spending more time outside. And I think there's wonderful examples in Europe of how they do this. So if I just look here, these are those three red dots, and I'm going to try and run literally through these three projects. I apologize now, as each one could take an hour. Um, as there are long histories in each one of them. So Betty Farm was the first one on the bottom right-hand side in a kind of a suburban neighborhood. They're all in, the, uh, you know, in er relatively urban contexts. Uh, Rosemont right on a metro subway station and Boilin right on a subway station in Laval. Uh, so again, we try and um, push these projects where we don't need to count on cars. Benny Farm really is an interesting uh, Ebenezer Howard experiment of the Garden City uh, right in the middle of the heart of Montreal, uh, designed in 1940s uh, by Harold Doran based on uh, many of the designs that come from Europe, uh, the, the Tweendorps, the Garden Cities, and uh, Stein, jo Clarence Stein from New Jersey had built quite a few combinations here in New York State and New Jersey, uh, a quite interesting model about how we're going to get high quality green space, air quality, and uh, enough density. In fact, Benny Farm was a scandal, a three-story housing project in a two-story neighborhood back in 1947. So this was built for the veterans coming back from the Second World War. Um, and for us, it was our first big lesson, Mark, my co-founding partner and I, on social activism. We worked with uh, mostly women in their 50s who um, found a way to give back to the community and try and save uh, the demolition of uh, 370 units and the reconstruction, tripling the density, doubling the height, and privatizing the site. And I think at that time we were influenced by people like Martha Rossler who, who said, you know, the housing rights for the, the less fortunate uh, should be a, a right and, and not just a luxury. Um, the product was very controversial. Uh, it's interesting we described a little bit in the book um, uh, because you had the veterans who were kind of told either you move into these new buildings on one third of the site or we let you stay in these dilapidated buildings that were not so dilapidated and you live there for the rest of your lives and they weren't really given much of a choice of some renovation in between so it was a very 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 difficult time. You had veterans living in the building, neighbors who didn't want to see any densification, and a community who said, we don't want to lose this affordable, uh, incredible um, resource. And so uh, very, very difficult project. None of our products at Lift are very easy. Um, this is a very long history of uh, all the different combinations of renovating, total demolition, partial demolition, lessons along the way. Again, I, I can't really get into it much. Um, it was a three-period battle over those 20 years, and the last battle was really more about uh, um, here, this little experiment that we're going to do. We, I think we built about over 200 units on the site, but there's 187 that were scheduled to kind of test a little bit towards equilibrium. In our, in our case, back in early 2000, we were going towards 60% better than energy code and a whole series of experiments uh, way beyond just energy. So we created this uh, nonprofit organization that was going to become a community developer called Green Energy Benny Farm. We did all the legal research on how you actually set up an ESCO and allow the community to empower itself, look at uh, green roofs, uh, renewable energies, uh, conserving energy, reusing bricks, reusing buildings, um, treating water in, in so many fashions on site, involving all these different projects. Our biggest problem was, well, one of the problems on one of the projects has to do with our Charbonneau Commission, uh, as we found out years later. Um, and the other problems were really about the timing of the projects. Like we got about the equivalent of about 18% extra funding over regular social housing. Sounds like a lot of money, about maybe $15 a square foot. Um, and trying to do so much innovation um, when some of the clients had the time and effort to learn about it and others didn't. 
And I think that's uh, one of our biggest lessons is we have to have very resilient clients and very resilient users and not just very resilient energy systems. And we did have a problem with some of the resilient energy systems as well that weren't so resilient. Uh, the solar design to start with is our starting point uh, and uh, probably one of our biggest strengths. Um, this human scale of things, uh, trying to really uh, connect it to the people and their need for housing within a community that's really high quality community, always something we really cared about. The targets were always very visible. Uh, a lot of the work is just uh, devotion by the team, taking out the old Eleva radiators of the buildings that were being demolished and reusing them to renovate the existing buildings. Same with the wood flooring that never exists in affordable housing, and we were able to do so. Same with taking out the old, uh, you know, block, glass block, and reusing a new construction of renovation. So it's hard to tell what's renovated and what's new here. It's actually quite an interesting pastiche. You have to be a, an architect scholar to start looking at the details to see the differences, which is fun. And then you're, you're fighting basically an entire industry. So I think Benny Farm was a little bit too far, far in advance. Uh, we had contractors who didn't believe that we could take these old bricks down affordably and reuse them and uh, get as good a product, if not better. So one of the small little stories is uh, we did testing of the bricks and they actually perform better than the new bricks we can buy today, but you can actually get a warranty from the contractor for five years on the brick. But if you buy the less standard new brick, you can get a five-year warranty. So you, you get a lot of these kind of, so you spend a lot of time educating the client on risk management and they have to go with you as you move forward. So again, another really important thing for me is investing in public space, uh, something that's often not uh, clearly uh, a high enough priority in, in, in our programs. Uh, we somehow seem to I always liked uh, one of the products of Richard Enriquez uh, in Vancouver uh, where he convinced all the people who had a possibility of 450 square feet to cut it down to 350, design in Murphy beds and take the extra 100 square feet and increase public space in a building. And I think we're, it's funny because, you know, people have trouble living with 1,500 square feet and it's interesting how in the affordable housing people understand the importance of common and public space. The economic realism of how the buildings are going to be occupied is really fundamental and uh, you need to build in some resilience and some, some understanding of that culture as well. None of these things show up in our net zero calculations and uh, I spend a lot of time with some of my doctorate students trying to figure out how we could uh, change the way we look at frameworks because uh, they're quite imbalanced at the moment. But some of them are simply just architectural moves that make sense. You put shared space right on the street, you animate the space, you, you make it humane, you, you celebrate public space. You um, make the spaces accessible, you, you make them animated, you make them as green and as diverse in biodiversity as you can. It doesn't take away the need for urban systems. I think the advantage of uh, large-scale projects is uh, you can potentially share the budget of the uh, maintenance and operational costs over a much larger scale uh, and I think uh, in some ways we had this dream at Benny Farm. You see three products all connected with wonderful geothermal, solar thermal, existing backup uh, and new gas backup in case something goes wrong. I think the first thing that went wrong is all three products didn't get built together. The middle product, because of the problem I described earlier, actually was delayed by three or four years. And then the other two projects didn't have the same kind of clientele. So they ended up each individually running their own geothermal. And uh, that leads to uh, bigger challenges when you can't get everybody working together. So again, I, first big lesson is, is you can't start this until you have that uh, community resilience, uh, first and foremost. This was a really interesting study by a firm out of Germany, TransSolar, who looked actually in Quebec because of our heating dominated uh, culture or, or context. Um, we could freeze the ground that gives us the geothermal, so understanding that sometimes you're designing your solar thermal not because of what the modeling tells you, but it's actually your form of resilience dumping the extra hot water in the summertime back into the earth to make sure that you have that heat coming back uh, the following year, depending on whether you hit aquifers or not or what kind of soil you have. So there's been a lot of really fascinating lessons. 
one of the most uh, amazing parts is the kind of community garden that's where the seniors really meet the single mothers who are going back to school, who are teenagers, uh, who need babysitters and kind of support. And, and they both need support to actually get together and they do the gardening together. And this is where the friendships are made and uh, one of the biggest uh, successes of the projects. Yes, we do have some of the more sexy technologies. Sometimes the solar wall always works, the solar thermal panels sometimes work, uh, depending on uh, where you are in the cycle. Uh, going into existing buildings or new buildings and putting in um, what can be quite a, an overwhelming amount of technology is, is also something very important to take care of. So it was a really, I'd say the biggest success at Benny Farm was um, learning how to empower a community. And I think our next project said, we're not going to try and be 60% better than code. I think we're going to be maybe only 40% better than code. We're not going to spend 18% more. We're only going to spend 10% more. We're not going to start all measures on day one. We're going to grow over time. And we're going to let the client work and design with us and appropriate the project over a three, four year period before we start construction. So it was quite a few lessons that we applied. We actually, at this point, after the success of Benny Farm, got the city involved right from the beginning instead of fighting us along the way. And that was a big difference uh, in, in the processes. Funding bodies at that time were still available to get this. Although it took us a year of stopping the beginning of construction till the SHQ, uh, Société d'Habitation du Québec, developed uh, a kind of a 10% uh, innovative uh, Projet Novatel program, which allowed us to actually try this second experiment. And it's really, we put together two clients on this site so that we would have the mass of 155 units. There's 90 units in the kind of co-op Cotovel and another 60 in the, the, the OBNL um, and Tuapultus. We involved everybody from day one, companies, government officials, a really amazing long process. It's right next to a metro. It's um, a densification. The original zoning only wanted 110 units, and we said, no, we got to bring it up to uh, a much higher density. We have very rarely such amazing sites in the urban context, and that was a battle that took us about six months. Ran the workshops really with uh, future users around the table. One of the big differences, we were able to really, um, some of them were ex-students who joined a co-op who kind of brought us uh, in and that was a really interesting uh, technique as well. Another six to eight months was uh, battling the zoning on parking. Uh, we should have had 78 parking spots which would have meant no central space for kids to play and uh, just for cars and that would have been a disaster so till we fought the government and got it from 78 down to 12 and inside the 12 parking spots half of them are for car to go equivalent in Quebec and uh, and uh, um, reduce mobility users so in the end we were able to get both of our uh, capacity to you know store storm water on site uh, for 100 year floods uh, um, 100 year rains uh, that actually allow us for 48 hours to keep the water on site at the same time it becomes a play space for the kids. We didn't really have the money but I think we had a great technical resource group and we had given our own time and we spent a lot of time educating the future clientele right from the beginning so that they were able to appropriate the decision but in future projects we always hope that there'll be money to help educate everybody around the table from the beginning it's not really in our base architectural fees so yes there's two developers this uh, kind of uh, non-profit organization and this co-op and they get together and um, in some ways uh, landscape becomes a really big important component uh, again the budget we have in landscape for affordable housing projects in Quebec is close to zero so we almost have to find techniques around the rules in order to invest in public urban space um, and that becomes a challenge. Another big thing was we wanted every single unit at least in the co-op project to be uh, cross ventilation and uh, 
that's very hard on, you know, there's a logic to double loaded corridors, uh, financially speaking. And so we spend a lot of our money in the typology. So it's interesting, how do you sneak that in? Because you're supposed to get this extra 10% just for green measures. And this is a passive green measure where you can actually open two windows and actually move air. Uh, so it's, it's, there's becomes a lot of effort just to try and work around the rules of programs, which actually you think they help us. And in the end, they, they often harm us uh, and take away the capacity of the client expressing themselves. So we, we find all types of techniques to, to do this. Um, and then this was really cool. Uh, there's kind of passive and active uh, technologies mixed together, some current, some future. So we tried to find the right balance uh, and communicate it and educate the clients so that they would make the right choices. And it's very interesting for them, the green roofs, which they knew were not going to be big energy savers. In fact, uh, Christian would have it down at zero because we have no budget for air conditioning in Quebec, social housing or affordable housing. So it's more about comfort and about uh, activism and belief in uh, maybe even, you know, production, food production. This was starting to become a big issue in 2007, 2008. So we modeled the... Uh, the building, we showed it on 42% on day one, and we showed how it could make it up to close to net zero one day over time, um, depending on government grants, which play such a big factor, and the cost of energy, which in Quebec is such a problem. Um, so, you know, how can a project really grow over time? How can you build in uh, roof loads that you don't have to change later on? How can you put in piping and wiring so you don't have to go in and rip up interiors of buildings in order to change a building over time. So we call it future proofing. Um, and then you really, uh, you have to create this amazing collective space. Uh, the engineering room uh, underneath the public, we had no money for a, uh, a kind of a, a community group room, uh, but we had money for the geothermal system. So we decided to put it underground to save energy. And then while well, we had a free basement and structure, so. We got a local company to help build the pavilion for free on top of it that doesn't break the rules. And um, it's amazing because when you start to work with community activists, uh, the excitement when the project comes is, is, is really uh, wonderful. One of our biggest problems actually is the people entering the project have such high expectations of living in a net zero project with all the bells and whistles that they are the harshest critics, uh, quite interestingly. Um, but it goes down to all the details, uh, working with nip paysage on landscape, uh, care, you know, just simple strategies, passive strategies, uh, caring about materials, caring about simplicity. Uh, you know, the, the low-tech uh, solutions are something we've pushed all along. And I just was there a couple of weeks ago with a guest in from Spain. And yes, they still uh, dry the laundry all the way out until, until the snow comes. Um, and I, I do think, you know, we do spend some time on trying to make it architecturally interesting, and I think that's important, and there's a lot of pride for the people living in the project. So CMHC, Voitech, and uh, NH, uh, NRCAN, Michel Tardif, and then Hydro-Quebec, and GRAP, and a whole series of people, someone living in the project who's an ex-student who's doing her doctorate or his doctorate. And, I, um, and we have a really interesting design on how to do monitoring. It took us about a year to learn how to even get all the monitoring equipment to work. <laughs> and then another year to do the monitoring. I think no one talks about how hard it is to monitor. Um, and uh, the results came in this summer. We're, we are exactly as designed or a little bit better, somewhere around 45, 50% better than energy code. Of course, you have to accept that there's, it's not perfect. If you're on the top floor, you're 70% better than energy code. If you're on the ground floor, you're at 10%. If you're in the middle, you're at about 40, 45%. So we're starting to learn how to try and control that kind of problem, which is quite typical in three and a half story uh, construction. And as I move on, uh, now our latest project uh, is a uh, really challenge. It's, it's, steel, stud, concrete, carcass, uh, the building that Christian talked about in Vancouver, as we try and do a very urban, heavy-duty, six-story, 13-story combination project next to a, a metro in Laval. So it's literally, you can see the blue dots. It's about uh, 12 minutes if you follow all the rules. If you take a sneak in the back way, it's about six minutes. 
So again, that was a big consideration about making sure um, you're going to bring in density. And the city of Laval has actually changed all of its density around its new subway stations, which uh, core kind of Todd thinking. Um, and then, of course, uh, I wanted to reduce even more our dependency on money. So now we're working with only 7% more than our regular social housing budget. So in, in today's dollars, that's maybe the same $15, but it's, it's uh, 10 years later or eight years later than Benny Farm. Um, and we have a Y, which is going to be our six-story seniors component. And the XZ has a part that's for families and a part for seniors with a centralized courtyard and uh, forced upon us a certain amount of parking. Uh, but what makes this project so ideal for future monitoring is in one project you will get uh, our Y, which is towards passive house standard, our X, which is our um, minimal Novo Clima general basic standard, and our Z, which is a hybrid between X and uh, Y, closer to X. And uh, in one project, we'll be able to actually see on the same site with the same clientele almost um, quite a range of what's working best, and not just technologically, but education-wise, et cetera. But so it's very, very exciting uh, for us to be able to try and design this. Again, we've had some support from the charrettes from the beginning from CMHC, and now as we move towards preparing for monitoring from Anarchan and CMHC, so we, we took out four basic principles, reduce the thermal bridging, increase the air tightness, HRV recovery, and uh, windows and doors. Uh, we based it on four basic principles. Uh, all of them are quite obvious, except futurity, uh, which is a futurity, which is a, a little bit still new. Um, and um, from this, you, um, you look at initial costs, operational costs, and replacement costs. And because the replacement costs, we wanted to enter the, the factor, we said, okay, like Thomas pointed out, we can look at 30 years because this is someone who's going to own their building for the rest of time. It's, you know, it's not something where the government is involved. The government gives you money to build it and to have a mortgage for half the cost, and it's up to the client, the client to build up their replacement cost budgets and manage their own project uh, as they move forward. So uh, again, we, we tried to use language that we could talk to our clients because they had no interest in high-tech uh, solutions. They're mostly seniors on the board of volunteers. So they're interested in how can we get the best skin and, and, and healthy lungs and, and move around our blood systems properly and, uh, and make sure we have a, a good uh, a mise en service, a good organized uh, way of vetting out the system afterwards. So we started off with the charrette. We looked at the issues. We involved a bunch of engineers. Frédéric Genet has been involved in many of our projects over the years, from Rosemont to this one, as a designer, a mechanical engineer. But we also had Kurt uh, Hepting involved, Ener Enersis involved in simulation before the charrette, similar to what Christian does. He does a base building takes your project and helps you understand. But what's interesting here is we never just looked at energy during the workshop and we kind of use little number signs to not get too detailed and we tried to balance everything. And for us, this was really critical for our client because for them, looking at energy alone to, to rule the decision making would have been an error. Yes, we do have uh, numbers of uh, energy units per square meter. You know, big, in Quebec, we would normally get about 240 kilowatt hours per square meter, and our design came in at about 134. So, yeah, we still expect to be as good as Rosemont, 40, 45% better than energy code, but with a huge, huge component in envelope, almost nothing in mechanical, which I'll explain in a couple of seconds. And I think this change towards the envelope um, really pleased our client. Is again, a lot of them spend too much time in their units, and that thermal comfort is fundamental. As governments want, they want us to somehow financially uh, work out every single measure. So we do the exercise. We know it's somewhat artificial and, and very complex, but it does give us a, a general ballpark. Um, the construction underway, we've been following it. Uh, had some people here from CMHC come and visit it during construction and NRCAN as well. So the issues around windows and the thermal comfort, the air leakage, uh, the time spent around those windows. And 
You know, it's not just a window. You can buy triple glazed windows if you don't install them in the right location and you don't know how to deal with the thermal bridging, you're throwing out the money of these triple glazed windows. So again, actually different studies by um, um, Graham Finch and others across country looking at location of windows. So we, we tried very hard. Again, we're working with 7% over regular funding, which is an uh, embarrassing low amount of money. So. I was very excited to sketch up this detail with fiberglass uh, section cantilevering the window. In the end, uh, they came back with another way of doing it with the typical plywood in Quebec. And this is not exactly what was installed, but it is located cantilevered outside of the steel stud, so it is in the right location. And we'll monitor to see how good this one works, given, again, how much money we have. We know very clearly effective R values and nominal R values are, are day and night, and uh, especially for concrete steel. So like an R25 is worth about R7, uh, and how do you actually change that? As we know about all the uh, thermal bridging issues, and as your building becomes more and more airtight, all of a sudden the thermal bridging, which is sometimes is as little as 10% energy loss, moves up to 30%. Uh, it's a little bit like the appliances. They get exaggerated as you become much more. Um, but for me, it's not just about energy. It's about long-term uh, durability of the envelope. This client doesn't have any expertise or money to change that envelope for many, 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 many years. And so we better get this right. And I think that's really critical. So that's a lot of our thermal bridging. So we've been testing different technologies uh, that have not been used for the first time. They're not guinea pigs, really. So these are fiberglass elements that allow us to go off the steel stud to support either our metal uh, cladding or our brick cladding. Uh, so this is a photo in sight from about a month and a half ago. We're supporting all of our insulation, 100% outside of our air barrier. So there's nothing inside the steel stud. And uh, uh, this is very helpful. Uh, it makes sure that, uh, you know, we can take a look at the case on the right, which is uh, the 13-story conventional, where you do have the thermal bridging through the steel, and on the left with the fiberglass clip. So it's interesting. We'll be having inside the walls a uh, uh, thermometre, uh, to actually sensors to look at the, the results and it should be quite exciting. We know that the kind of the lintel that supports the bricks uh, that's code required when you're past three stories is a huge problem. Of course, you know, in the perfect world, we'd afford the isocorb one on the right and we don't have that money in affordable housing. So uh, we found a, a local contractor who has his own techniques using some thermal... Uh, um, break in order to see how it works. It's not perfect, uh, but given our, we're very curious to see how, how well it works and monitor it. Uh, balconies are another huge problem because people spend so much time on their balconies and they're big, big balconies in affordable housing, especially as high ones. Again, we don't have any money to bring in uh, the technologies that come from Europe. This would eat up uh, two thirds of our, <laughs> of our 7%. Uh, so we worked with the engineers, and they came up with a really fascinating solution. They said, yeah, yeah, you, you know, we know about separating the two uh, with some insulation and, and allowing the kind of rebars to go through the slab, but we changed the rebars from steel to fiberglass. We have a lot of uh, technology in Quebec about using fiberglass rods instead of steel inside highways. And then because uh, fiberglass actually um, doesn't give you any warning. There's these kind of steel, stainless steel cables that in case there's an earthquake and the balcony falls, you have about 30 seconds until it collapses so you can actually possibly get out of the way. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, the whole, how it all works. You can see here how these huge balconies are insulated and, and separated. Um, air tightness in Quebec, our, our program Nouveau Climat, doesn't really test buildings beyond three stories. So uh, we did not give the contractor a choice. We put aside money to hire uh, a really well-known company in Quebec that does the best air tightness testing at large-scale buildings. And uh, we spent in the budget $60,000 of a series of tests from guaranteeing the performance of windows that don't just come from spec sheets in a lab somewhere I don't know where, uh, to actually testing the windows installed on site, 
uh, testing the mechanical shafts that are bringing our fresh air from the roof uh, through the building, that they're airtight, testing the, the tightness between units, testing between units on the corridor, testing between floors, testing the whole building of the six stories. And then being able to see this air tightness, which we put in 0 0.9 air changes per hour for a social housing project. I'm not aware of one at this scale in Canada that's attempting this. And we're doing it with a contractor who did our uh, project at Rosemont. And he has a lot of pride, and he comes actually to some of the lectures we organize. And uh, he has been performing to date incredibly. We've passed so far every test, and in about two weeks we'll be doing the big six story whole building test but he's been passing the envelope uh, the water tightness the air tightness the shaft tightness uh, and uh, with a lot of pride they, one of the few tests that backfired actually is a, a window that didn't have the proper ceiling on the inside of the triple glazing uh, you can see here in the bottom left hand corner a little hole there in the so they had to on site uh, remove it and replace it uh, but again it's interesting the window is a high quality window, it's actually what shows up on site and learning how to measure and how critical it is to measure it on site. And then um, the carpenter totally agreed and it's just a, you know, fighting between the contractor and the sub as to how to get it resolved and uh, it's very critical that we do this testing on site. But as designers we have to work with the engineers very closely. We found that every hole you have in a building uh, is a real problem. So here we have them all together. You see that metal flashing around the, the three holes here. Uh, that's your uh, kitchen exhaust, your uh, fresh air exhaust from your HRV and your laundry exhaust. Um, they all get one hole in the envelope so that we really try and control those, um, those problems. And none of our fresh air comes in anywhere uh, mechanically where our exhaust air is. We go fresh air from the roof, which allows us to use uh, our solar walls uh, to preheat the air and centralized uh, HRVs, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, we also try and help, uh, I'll be doing an education with the tenants, uh, users, the residents. I don't know how easy you can see, but there are sensors on the windows from the second floor to the sixth floor. And the logic is, is not that an alarm goes off and someone's guilty for opening a window in winter. But uh, when people do open windows, it only takes about three or four on the sixth floor to actually uh, possibly imbalance quite significantly the comfort elsewhere in the building. We've tried to separate every floor, and we don't know how successful we'll be that with that. But this is going to mean that I'll be able to come in with a software after a month and talk to the tenants and say, listen, you know, we know some people on the sixth floor have been affecting people on the second floor, and maybe we can all work together that we all have the same comfort instead of you know, uh, using a big brother approach. We'll have to see how this works. Um, lots of techniques on how to get the shafts to be airtight. Um, and they're passing the tests. Um, yeah, I'm getting down to about five minutes, right? Uh, I think I'll make it. Um, the bricks, uh, water airtight, water testing on site, very critical. We spend a lot of time on um, stopping the overheating because one of the problems with such a good envelope is uh, it could be a problem in the summertime because um, you can't actually uh, deal with some of the problems that you have. We don't have cross ventilation in every unit in this kind of typology. Um, so we designed uh, how to look out and how to block most of the overheating. We don't have perfect orientation in urban contexts. We're, you know, 35 to 40 percent off of pure south, so you can't get perfect. Uh, and we don't have monies and efforts to do kind of diagonal uh, uh, external sun blockers. So it was quite a challenge to figure out how much to do and how much to block the view and how to perform. We did look at external uh, blinds, which would be ideal in some ways, but they do block the view, which we felt ethically is a problem, as you can see here when we were testing them in the office. It's very interesting. After we designed and selected uh, fixed uh, sun blockers, the contractor had a sub who went behind our back right to the client offering to uh, provide automated uh, external blinds uh, to our client at the same cost or with a slight savings. 
which I thought was uh, disastrous because a lot of the windows uh, are not uh, going to be accessible to, to fix uh, from the balconies. And you'd need a cherry picker over time. And I would say, if you're willing to put $40,000 into a fund to deal with the maintenance over the next 15 years, and I could be open to the idea. And so that was a good way of stopping that. Uh, this is weird because you're seeing it without the brick around it. So it's, uh, but from the inside, it's, it's really quite um, light as far as uh, blocking your view. In fact, it's even designed to allow you to look towards the north with as much a wide view as you can. And um, I was at a site uh, about a month ago, took these photos. You can see the sun blocker on the left and the same unit, one over, not with the sun blocker on yet on the right and so the, the floor kind of the proof is in the pudding right there. Um, ventilation, if I was able to talk about it for a long time, which I can't, uh, we basically made it as simple as possible. We put central HRV on the roof that takes the air from minus 20 to minus 5. That's paid for centrally. And then from minus 5, it goes to every unit and they have their own little mini HRV, which doesn't have to be high end quality, doesn't have to have the filters that the main one has. And then at minus 5 to plus 15 or whatever, each tenant pays for. We found that Benny Farm, when no one connected their payment of their fresh air and MERBs, uh, we had a real problem because people kept on wasting money, opening windows, and not really caring. So, again, it's really about making the values, bringing the fresh air in the right location, organizing simple technologies, uh, getting the HRVs very simple, small detailings, um, just getting the controls down. We had a contractor was forced to hire one of three predetermined uh, um, agents that was going to help do the preparation for all these green measures on site. And that's been another wonderful move, about a cost of about $30,000. So it means that going through public social uh, housing tendering doesn't mean you're exposed to a contractor who doesn't understand how to properly organize the site. And so by having this team that knows how to do it, uh, in some ways, it really assists us. And it's been an excellent experience to date. So this is how we're going to monitor the units and not just the energy, but the thermal comfort and the performance of the wall. That's our friend Michel Tardif on site with the uh, mechanical engineer from Pajot Morel, uh, looking at our, how we're installing our wireless uh, um, um, sensors, uh, testing that they all work with our routers, and we look forward to a, a good year of monitoring data that, again, always looks at air quality and, and comfort and daylight and all these things and not simply energy. So um, we talk a little bit about this story in our book, um, and there's a few reports that are available from uh, CMHC and others that are coming very soon, and uh, we hope to continue to share the long, hard road to uh, community-inspired housing in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for that excellent presentation. Um, we have time for some questions. Matthew. Thank you for the presentation. Um, in Manitoba, the majority of the the housing that is social or affordable is owned by the province and we're considering ways of uh, moving ownership over to communities and when we talk about it we don't mean uh, just an external agency but rather actually communities themselves and the difficult to conceptualize the difference but anyways the in your first example, I think it was called Benny Hill Benny Farm, or Benny yeah. Farm. Uh, you talked about how you had created a community organization. Uh, did you replicate that in the other two models? Was that seen as a best practice? Well, j just to clarify, um, all of the three social or affordable housing products um, are from a program called Axelogy in Quebec, where the government gives enough money to buy the land, to build the building, to have a mortgage that you pay off over a 30 or so year period. So the, in all cases, the buildings are owned by the co-op or the nonprofit. It's just a formula to try and get the government out from managing buildings. What made Benny Farm unique was uh, we thought we would produce more energy than needed and start to 
help sell that energy to the community, to help sell it to other buildings on site at Benny Farm, to take the savings long term and share the savings to the tenants, education long term, and help change the whole neighborhood. So it's like a little bit like a community land trust where you actually have members of a board of community land trust are residents who live in the building, people in the neighborhood, and then experts from outside. And so you get always a really balanced view that housing is a right for a community uh, and not simply for the people living in the building. And that balance is really fundamental. I, I, I laud and commend your effort. I think that's the right approach. I know owned, we do a lot of renovations of OMASH, uh, government owned housing projects in Montreal and uh, we go into those products. That's how we earn a little bit of our money in between our bigger projects. And there's so little care on the buildings when people don't own them. And the repairs are often uh, more than the budget that we actually can repair them. And I think when people own a building and they know what it means to take care of it and they know what it means to design it, they just take care of it amazingly. It's interesting. Benny Farm was able to be renovated and Regent Park wasn't in Toronto, and the only difference was not technical. It was really a, a kind of a, an image. Regent Park had turned into a slum, and you couldn't renovate the slum imagery, uh, versus Benny Farm was always a pride of the veterans who stayed in the project all those years, and they never felt like they were in a slum. So it's, it's quite interesting. The issues are, are way beyond uh, technical balances. More questions? I have a question, Danny. In your presentation, you outlined key things. It links a bit to what Matthew said, too, that uh, long-term durability is, is critical for these projects, especially for your clients. And uh, long-term success really depends or is based on resident uh, implication, you called it. And I'm just wondering how to better facilitate or include or ensure that stage because, uh, you know, it's a massive amount of work in the front end, even if you get all the, the modeling and performance uh, and interactions, and then just trying to achieve uh, a high-quality, uh, high-performance building. But this is sort of an added step and element that is critical to a long-term success. I mean, one of the problems when you're a, a teacher in a well-known uh, firm in the community is you can't run away from your projects. Uh, you actually have to, you have to walk the walk. And um, I go back to Rosemo once a year to give a lesson on the systems to all the people who move into the co-op every year and talk about how you still can determine your own future. There's lots of techniques and systems that have not yet been activated in the kind of futurity of the project. Um, I'm hoping uh, on this next Project Boy Len, uh, with your assistance, to develop a manual that will help be incredibly simple for people to understand and help them appropriate as new tenants come into the project. What are the key points, not just to running the project, but you know, envisioning its future? So I think that between uh, general education and a better job of the designers passing on how to run the building, and then holding their hand in the first year of, uh, of monitoring, I think, is also a helpful thing. I mean, we don't send our kids out at the age of 10 um, to live alone. You know, we try and teach them some values along the way, and it's a very long process till they finally move out, and then they move back in. Uh, that's a little bit like um, community-inspired housing. I mean, you, you must build into your pro forma, and it's not done enough time to make sure the education is solidly uh, anchored in, in, in the collective. I know you're all waiting for lunch. <laughs> there must be some more questions. Good. Okay. okay. Well, uh, this brings us to the end of our session. Thank you very much, Danny.